We gather together in the name of Jesus Christ, members of God's family, and brothers and sisters to one another. There are no outsiders here among us. No one has any special standing or bragging rights, for we have been brought together by the redeeming love of Jesus. Let's join together in worship. Please rise as able and join me in prayer. Holy God of Israel, ever present and moving among your people, draw us near to you, that in place of hostility there may be peace, in place of loneliness, compassion, in place of aimlessness, direction, and in place of sickness, healing. Through Christ Jesus, in whom you draw near to us. Amen. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not the God. They fail not as thou hast been, thou forever shall be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. in whom we live and move and have our being, whose face is hidden from us by our sins, and whose mercy we forget in the blindness of our hearts. Cleanse us from all our offenses and deliver us from proud thoughts and vain desires that with reverent and humble hearts we may draw near to you 
confessing our faults, confiding in your grace, and finding in you our refuge and strength through Jesus Christ, your Son. Lord, in your great mercy, hear these our prayers. Amen. Our righteousness is found in Christ alone, a gift of God by faith. Beloved people of God, believe the good news. Through the grace of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Amen. Be kind to one another and tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. Testament lesson today comes from 2 Samuel, the seventh chapter, beginning with the first verse. It's in regard to God's covenant with David. Now, when the king was settled in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, the king said to the prophet Nathan, See now, I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God stays in a tent. Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan. Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, Are you the one to build me a house to live in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent and a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about among all the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be prince over my people Israel, and I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, so that they may live in their own place, and be disturbed no more. And evildoers shall afflict them no more as formerly, from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your ancestors, 
I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come forth from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. This is the word of the Lord. And every age shall know your name. I sing of mercies that endure forever, firm, forever sure, a strong support that never dies, established, changeless in the sky. Almighty God, your lofty throne has justice for its cornerstone and shining bright before your face are truth and love and boundless grace. With blessing in the nation crowned whose people know the joyful sound they in the light O Lord shall give the light your face and favor give Our New Testament this Morning comes from the letter of Paul to the Ephesians, second chapter, beginning with verse 11. We are one in Christ. So then remember that at one time, you Gentiles by birth, called the uncircumcision by those who are called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall, that is the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace, and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near, for through him, both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. Here ends the reading of the epistle. Praise be to you, O Lord. As Abel, would you please rise for the reading from the gospel. It comes to us from Mark. It is Mark's account of the feeding of the 5,000. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him 
all that they had done and taught. He said to them, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now, many saw them going and recognized them and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, a great crowd saw him and he had compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When it grew late that his disciples came to him and said, this is a deserted place and the hour is now very late. Send them away so that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy something for themselves to eat. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. They said to him, are we to go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, how many loaves have you? Go and see. When they found out, they said, five and two fish. Then Jesus ordered them to get all the people to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and of fifties. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And all ate and were filled. They took up twelve baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. Those who had eaten the loaves numbered 5,000 men. The Gospel of our Lord. Glory to you, O Christ. Kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be This week and last, we've been reading from the sixth chapter of Mark. Most of this chapter centers on two very different feasts. One, the birthday banquet of the Galilean tetrarch, Herod. As Mark tells it, the narrative could be titled a feast of death. The story it tells includes the grisly details of the beheading of John the Baptist some while before. It is an odd insertion into the unfolding gospel that Mark is writing of Jesus' story and the exercise of the power of God at work. Herod's banquet is a ghastly expression of calculated political power meant to impress. As we examine the will to power in our choice making, Herod's banquet is a tawdry and sordid affair. In choosing the way of God, Death itself becomes 
a Good Friday kind of feast in Christ our Lord, through which our will to power finds its strength in the loving service, mercy, and grace of God, costing not less than everything he had through Christ. This second story is the feeding of the 5,000 that each of the four gospel writers record. It is that important. Mark's take on the feeding of the 5,000 coming as it does after Herod's grisly banquet of death is a feast of life. A narrative contrast meant to underscore what God's power and God's kingdom is all about. The feeding of the 5,000 becomes a pre-Easter picnic, if you will. A miraculous transformation of nothing much into Plentiful abundance, enough for all. God can do a great deal with a little bit. Come and see. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, make us masters of ourselves, that we may become the servants of others. Take my lips and speak through them. Take our minds and think through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire. For we would see Jesus this morning. Amen. My dad, the real Reverend Silbert, wanted space, peace, and quiet time for his family, especially after a full morning of church. That wasn't always a given. We had three services on Sunday in Uniontown, Third Presbyterian Church, 8, 9, 30, and 11. Sunday school sandwiched in between. Growing up, I remember many, many dinners on Sundays were formal affairs at the manse with the best linen from the buffet sideboard in the dining room and silver service as far as it went. The blue glass water goblets made their appearance and the cut glass salt and pepper shakers were like sentinels on duty at either end of the middle of the table. Depending on the number of guests attending, <clears throat> FHB was a quick whispered rule from mother into each of our ears. Gastronomical calculations were made out of sight in the kitchen. The food in the oven and on the stove was divided by the number of guests invited to dinner that day. Depending on the sum, FHB was invoked or not. Do any of you know what the initials FHB stand for? Thank you. Say it again, Nancy. Family hold back. Family hold back. And it was an ethic of proportionality that made thoughts of seconds on the pot roast or the mashed potatoes evaporate like steam does when the pot lid is raised or the oven door is opened. FHB at dinner meant we breathed in our seconds as aromas only sitting at table on days like that. When space, peace, and quiet time were able 
to be taken on a Sunday, especially in the summertime uh, and especially up along the slopes of the Laurel Mountains. I remember them as picnic suppers in places like Lick Hollow State Park and Jamonville Glen or Mount Davis, Pennsylvania's highest point south of Somerset. These were places to go away by ourselves on a family picnic. What I remember about those picnics was that we had more time with dad as dad. He always packed his fielder's mitt, a stiff, padded, goofy right-handed thing from an older era of his left-handed baseball career in the sandlots of inner city Philadelphia. Playing catch with dad? Tremendous. I also remember that mother's wax paper packed picnics were an amazing surprise. And there was always enough for everybody. Lick Hollow on a summer Sunday picnic getaway came to mind as I read Mark's story here in chapter 6. Unlike Herod's macabre dinner party read last week, a feast of death, the feeding of the 5,000 is a feast of life. A late day miracle where five loaves and two fish were more than enough for everybody. Okay, I grew up learning uh, for vacation Bible schools. You know, you, you, you uh, learn things and you got points or you got a prize or you build up stuff. And I learned in one of those early vacation Bible schools, the 23rd Psalm. I bet some of you did too, and probably learned the King James Version. Right? Okay, so here we go. Say it with me, if you know it. Ready? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures, he leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Marvelous. Good job. Now, did you notice what Mark does in telling us his story this morning. Please turn in your pew Bibles to page 818. 818. <clears throat> Please look at verse 34. As he, the he is Jesus, 
went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. Who is Jesus? The Lord. What does Jesus do? He is the shepherd of the sheep. My shepherd. Your shepherd. And there's two. Okay, let's continue. Let's look at verse 35. When it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now very late. Send them away so that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy something for themselves to eat. But he answered them, You give them something to eat. And what does the good shepherd do for you? Listen. <sighs> yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, all those deserted places, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me. Now, when the food calculations were made, five loaves and two fish, what do we read in verse 39? Then he ordered them to get all the people to sit down in groups on the green grass. And where does the good shepherd lead the sheep? He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. Get it? Mark wants his readers to make a deep connection to the goodness and greatness of God, to God's care and keeping. What better way to do that than to bring them, bring his listeners, bring the story at the feet of King David? In his words from the 23rd Psalm. The feast of life this week is grounded in the goodness and greatness of God, who through his son Jesus is the great shepherd of the sheep. Did you notice that when the people saw Jesus and his disciples going, they ran after him, literally beating the boats to the place where they were going? Jesus once said, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And seeing them, he had compassion for them. That's an amazing word in the Greek. It's really hard to pronounce. Esplanknitze. It's kind of explosive. Kind of rumbles. Okay.
Compassion in the Greek is rooted in the deep feeling of the guts. This lakeshore picnic in the green grass is one of deep connection to people. To not only see them coming near, but feeling in the deep places of his own emotions their needs even before they know to ask about them. Such is God's love for us all in our Savior Jesus. <sighs> he knew their needs before they even asked him. <laughs> Dad threw his baseball mitt into the back of the station wagon where it landed in the pile with ours. <laughs> that came to me too, specifically, as I read this passage this week. Dad as dad. And then there is the miracle itself. The feeding of 5,000 by five loaves and two fish as they sat on the, what? Green grass. You know, I have read people who are willing to accept the virgin birth. But then, they try to humanize this feast of life. In a stone soup kind of a way. The miracle is everybody pitches in. Oh look, they're giving their, their, their five loaves and two fish. Oh, I, you know. And the next thing, it's FHB becoming MIS. FHB becoming, make it stretch. I suppose that can be the human side of miracle making. <laughs> but to what purpose here? Don't cheat the wonder. The feeding of the 5,000 is a miracle. An event in time where a little is made into a lot. When all we have is five loaves and two fish among a dozen or so people that becomes a feast for 5,000. Where our FHB becomes God's EFE. EFE? Yes. EFE. Enough for everybody. And I don't believe that the miracle is humanized by people reaching into their haversacks to offer up a piece of bread here, some nuts there, uh, a couple of dates over there. No! That's not worthy as an explanation for what God can do. A miracle is defined as an extraordinary event an extraordinary event manifesting divine intervention in human affairs. Easter is a miracle. Virgin birth is a miracle. The feast of life in feeding 5,000 
on a couple of fish and a few rolls is a miracle. Please, don't dumb it down to make it fit into our limited and ordinary thinking and physics. In a world of situations where a host of hunger seemingly has only five loaves and two fish to feed it. I don't know about you, but I need miracles to happen. I want Easter possibilities late in the day and in deserted places. I believe in pre-Easter picnics because I believe God can do a lot with a little. I believe in miracles. With God, there's always enough. Enough for everybody. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please rise as we affirm our faith together. Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. In him, all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible. All things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, 
so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. of miraculous abundance through what is offered in the moment of need, bless these gifts and offerings we bring to you in this moment that they may become part of your banquet for the world. Amen. Go now into the world with confidence, partnering with others in ministry and mission. Go out with open hands and open hearts. Seek peace and pursue it. As God's people, we are called, gathered, centered, and sent. So let us go then in grace, with hope and full of joy, to serve the Lord. And now may God peace who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus. among 
us that 